Not a problem. If you are ready. Ready when you are. Great stuff. Hello, friends. Welcome back. Uh, this is episode two uh, of the Critical uh, Video Podcast. And today we are going to just cover one little bit we did not in the previous episode on rooms, but that'll be very briefly. And then we are going to cover our hearing, how we hear and how we listen, as I said the previous time. Those are two very different things. Um, but we'll get into that shortly. My name is Sorrel, call me SP for short. And I'm William, call me yeah. Will for short. <laughs> Great stuff. So um, on the previous uh, episode, as I, as I mentioned um, on the room, one of the things is there are the two components that we always have to think about when we do the evaluation and do the critical listening. And as I mentioned, the critical thinking, um, the, the, the brain twister that I mentioned, critical thinking is more important to critical listening than critical listening is to critical listening. And we'll get throughout the series, this will be a reoccurring theme and we'll get into that. Um, the, the two ways that we evaluate is objectively and subjectively, obviously. Uh, subjectively is when we use our ears and just think about things and listen to the room and listen to the various modes in the room. Um, some people have got better developed um, hearing than what other people's have specifically to evaluating the environment that we that we are are in. Uh, and that is normally just due to either training or just to lots and lots of experience, William. And, and you'll have lots of experience as an example, um, having done more listening, uh, critical listening in many more different places uh, than a lot of other people may have had the opportunity to. So that's the one way and it's, it's totally valid to evaluate a room from a subjective perspective, what you listen to and, and how you perceive that. The other way is obviously more objectively, and the reason for that is if we cannot measure something, we cannot really objectively use the analysis to affect a specific change. With the subjective method, the changes that we do will be much broader, not as much of a precision solution. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's not as much of a precision solution as what uh, the object of monitoring will be. Also, the other thing that is uh, frequently a problem is there's a lot of our own internal biases, like at the end of the previous video, um, engineering versus the emotional assessment of a, a, a situation or, or of a room or of a system itself. And the together with the biases, there there is uh, rules of thumb, which is not always correct, but sometimes a good guide. But there are also cases of um, myths and uh, dogma that is uh, kind of part of the audiophile environment and, and, and has been for, for, for a long time. So we need to be um, cognizant of what those things are and attempt to at least um, manage those so that they don't bedevil what we are really trying to create at the end of the day. Inside of a room, it is important that the treatment in the room addresses the specific issues that's inside the room so that we can listen critically and get the maximum out of our investment in the gear and the house and the room and the treatment and, and, and all the other things surrounding that. So the, the issue is, at the end of the day, is really one of doing the best with what we have inside of our rooms uh, without blowing the budget, um, because that's also easy to do. We are going to have a specific uh, episode on um, stereo imaging and, and imaging in general and, and, and how it is possible for us to uh, virtually recreate that 
staging, imaging um, area. And um, before we can do that, however, is today's episode, which is the one on listening and hearing. Let me just get my notes in front of me so that I don't get lost in this because it is going to get a little bit of a wild ride today with um, diving into the anatomy of our ears and 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 uh, fortunately not the brain because um, yeah. know, having, having, having read through your list notes, I'm looking forward to the session with some interest it must be said <laughs> because right. it speaks so, to what I speaks to what I've said for a very long time and it's uh, uh, we'll get there when we get there so so Right, that is that is certainly uh, exciting to to um, know the anticipation because uh, this maybe is voicing some of the things that that you have empirically derived at um, over a long many decades. Well, you know what what you said about the subjective versus the objective uh, sort of critical listening type thing really resonates with me because you know when you move. When one's listening subjectively, one knows something's slightly off. So how do we know what's off? It's because we hear our ears just from a reference point of view are saying, listen, this is not quite right. So how do we fix it? We move stuff around and we see what happens. You know, So it's kind of like throwing mud at a wall to see what sticks. Whereas objectively, if, it is, if, it, if it's a case of the frequency analyzer is telling you there's a hole in the room or whatever it is, then you have an idea and a hypothesis that you can then execute against and measure the, 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 the results subjectively. So there's a balance between both. You know, it's, 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 it's a case of understanding what's happening in the room around you certainly does help understand the subjective point of view of, of, of what your ears are hearing. So you know, there's, a, there's a huge amount that's going into this. 100%, uh, William. And, and the funny thing is, even though we, we talk about the objectivity of doing measurements and understanding frequencies and modeling uh, what is in general referred to as base traps and things like that, even that objective data is not a 100% on the money numbers perfect game that we are playing. At best, it is taking making a few assumptions about the material we use in the treatment of the room and it's making assumptions about the room. We model the room virtually and, and none of those things are 100% accurate, but it gives us good guidance and interpreting the numbers like statistics, uh, there is lies, damn lies, and then there is statistics. Now, this is exactly the same. Um, exactly. Uh, you can you can interpret the numbers any which way that you, that you like. Hopefully, you would enjoy the outcome after having done it subjectively, then objectively, build yourself some treatment for the room or buy some treatment of the room, and we'll get into the various types of treatments and things. There's lots and lots of resources on YouTube but like I said, lies, damn lies, and statistics, man, um, measurements in our in this industry for for hi-fi equipment and, and room treatments, it's bedeviled by dumbing down things and omitting. It, it's lying by omission in a to a to a large extent. Um, so that's something that hopefully uh, we'll be able to address. Great. Getting into hearing and listening, big difference between those two things. We use our ears to listen and uh, to understand uh, the perceived sounds that, that we get. We hear with our ears, but we certainly don't listen with our ears. That's a function of our brains. The listening part happens inside the brain. The interpretation part happens inside the brain. The funny thing is sound will trigger emotions. Now think about that for a moment. If you suddenly get a fright, somebody shouts at you and you don't see the person, you might jump from the skruits crook. Um, it's an emotional response. Somebody may say something that you don't like and you can get cross. That's an emotional response. Uh, somebody can say, um, well, you can listen to your favorite music and then that elicits an emotional response. So our response to all of these things is always emotional to the listening part. So let me just, illustrate the difference between hearing and listening, and we'll dive into listening now. Um, a listening or, or, or hearing, rather, is a little bit like a microphone plugged in, but there's a mute switch which kills the, the microphone signal. So hearing is like the microphone receiving the 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 
noise or, or voice or music, transmitting it through the wire, but it doesn't get to the amplifier or the speakers, that's hearing. Listening is taking it off mute and then it actually gets processed somewhere so that it can be understood, interpreted, enjoyed, or whatever the case may be. So that's just an easy way of uh, understanding what that difference is. So before we start on the listening thing, I think it is also important not to get too hung up on the gear and the room and all of these things. At the end of the day, just casual listening is about enjoying the the gear that you've got, enjoying the room that you're in, enjoying the friends and the family that you're doing this with. Uh, also, um, if you get too hung up, sometimes we forget about the end game, which is the enjoyment of what it is that we are listening to. So in in difference to hearing, listening is really an active um, function. To be able to, to really listen voluntary, pe people can't make you listen to something. You have to voluntarily subject yourself to processing the stuff that, that, that your ears have picked up. And that'll allow us to make sense of the words and, and, and whatever it is that we are taking in via our ears. For, for music, the auditory perception is really everything. Um, you can't listen to music and, and not process it because your brain will just cut off and, and you won't even realize that you are listening to, to something specific. So it, it's like, it's like if you're a piano player or a guitar player, to be able to really play well, you have to live every single note that you play. You have to use your critical listening, your ears, and the training in the music and over years in, in hearing the notes, uh, the pitch of the note, if it is off or if it is a harmonic or whatever the case may be, to be able to do so. And, and that is all part of... Um, like a muso, if you're doing critical listening, you do exactly the same thing. Now, we'll get a little bit into the language of music uh, towards the end of this, uh, but sufficient to say that to be able to really listen to music and perceive the music, you have to focus on it. it it's You can't listen to music if you're not focused on that activity, not critical in it. I have to, I have to emphasize the point, you know, that all the great musicians in the world have spent years and years and years and years and far more than the 10,000 hours to achieve uh, uh, what's it mastery of a, of a, of a, of a particular skill set, training their brains to actively process and actively listen. And I'm now actively processing and listening to my dogs barking at something in the background, <laughs> which I hope is not coming through too badly on the, on, on, on the, the joys we have in, in recording and and the whole the whole issue with listening is that it is a function of brain training so when you when you when you refer to earlier that maybe i've got some experience not necessarily wisdom when it comes to listening to systems it's it's about the fact that i spent hours and hours and hours and hours of very pleasant and enjoyable time most of it in front of in front of music and my brain has been trained to be able to process that and 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 and, and benchmark it against various reference memories and 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 when you say music is about emotion that is exactly it we write about it all the time we have an emotional com connection with our with our system it's not an emotional connection with the system it's emotional connection with the music that the system is playing and that and that speaks again to memory you know sort of you you, you remember a song that triggered a specific emotional event in your life and that is particular and specific to you Absolutely. and conditions under which you hear that influence and color your judgment of when you hear it again and 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 this is this this i think is it's such an important part of of what makes everybody's listening experiences and i say listening experiences different quite it's not right or wrong it's okay. just about understanding what's happening and this is why i love this technical series that you're putting together so because it's giving us that background so quite carry correct. on Right. Um, <clears throat> I think what is important next is just to understand a, a little bit about sound propagation, what it is, how it works, um, not too, too deep into that, but basically sound producing, sound speaking, playing instruments or just dogs barking is, is a 
means of producing waves of pressure difference information. So if, if I say uh, P, the, the, the way that we make the sound is we build up a little bit of pressure inside of our mouths and then it suddenly es escaped. That plosive sound for P is a high pressure followed by a low pressure. Now, inside the letter, when we pronounce it, there are various high and low pressures. And the louder we talk, the bigger the pressure difference gets between the low pressure and the high pressure. So if we speak softly or music is played softly, that is the relative pressure difference. Let me just do that. And as the volume goes up, so the pressure differences goes up. Now, that is important when we get to the ear and how the ear functions. Um, the other thing, I think, is a couple of misconceptions. Um, we tend to not necessarily think about this um, in, a, in a technical fashion, but we believe that our census is complete and it gives us an accurate picture of the world. So if we look outside, we see all the colors and the beautiful country that we live in, and uh, we look at the hi-fi, we see the actual equipment and, and everything. But that is definitely not the complete picture. There are infrared uh, signals and ultraviolet signals and X-ray and gamma rays and all sorts of other things in a much, much broader spectrum. In the real spectrum, the, the visual part is this much, and it is yeah. a massive amount of spectrum that our eyes can't pick up, our ears can't pick up. We've got no way to process that information. We don't need to process the information, let's be clear, but the misconception is that our vision and smell and taste and, and, and feel and all of those senses gives us a complete picture. Nothing but. Uh, it, it, it certainly doesn't give us a complete uh, picture of, of, of the world. And the second misconception is our senses are looking and listening to different things. So there are different types of things that the senses are tuned into. So when we look at something, um, we can't see the vibrations of the sounds. When we listen to something, we can't see the color of whatever it is that is making the sound, as an example. So we believe that those two senses is completely separate, completely different senses, but they're not. They're processed by the same brain, they process at the same time, and they overlap. They really do overlap inside of our brains. Um, so for a moment, while you were busy speaking, if 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 we just pause on, on, on the dog barking, there are various things that are happening. On my side, there's a computer fan and there's a UPS fan that's, that, that's going in the background. Uh, you can hear some of that. Um, appliances buzz away, uh, birds on the outside. I've, I've got our favorite bird, the Harida, uh, just outside. <laughs> I'm, I'm, it, it, it's, it's waiting for a certain cue and then it'll go off, um, I guess. Oh, but, the <laughs> exactly. So the, the belief is that the senses are completely separate, but they're not. Um, if we think of infrasound, uh, a, a very low frequency, very low pitch noise, we, our ears can't pick that up. If it's below t about 20 hertz, our ears won't be able to pick it up. But guess what? We can feel that. We've, we've all felt a bass note uh, resonate inside our, inside our chest cavity as an example. You didn't hear that note. There's no way that you can hear that note because you, your inner ear can't process that. The cochlea can't do that but we were made aware by the resonance inside of our own body. So that's a way to experience um, some of the some of the sound. So <clears throat> there has been interesting beg your pardon. <clears throat> there's been interesting research that's been done on psychoacoustics. Psychoacoustics is responsible really for everything that we are talking about here. Um, uh, Hi-fi, just radio broadcast, television broadcast, psychoacoustics was at the root of all of these things originally. So the experiment goes as follows. You play a pure sine wave of 1,000 hertz, 1,200 hertz, and 1,400 hertz. 
when that was done to people and they were asked what they were hearing, they were all describing a pitch of about 200 hertz, which was never played. Pure sine wave, 1,000, 1,200, 1,400. But psychoacoustically, our brains understood because of our experiences, that these are, uh, I think, the fourth, fifth, and sixth harmonics, or fifth, sixth, and seventh harmonics, I can't remember exactly, uh, harmonics, and the fundamental frequency for that would be 200 hertz. Our brains understood that, and for the people experiencing those three frequencies at the same time, they heard 200 hertz. So our brains are lying to us. Not our ears, but our brains are really lying to us. So where does that leave the so-called golden-eared uh, listeners, reviewers, musicians, uh, 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 studio mastering engineers, recording engineers. There's no doubt that people do have different capabilities when it comes to listening. Uh, as you eloquently said, uh, practice over many years. But that begs the question, where does it leave that? Because our brains are lying to us and we've got no control over that whatsoever. Uh, the brain does what the brain does. It understands the harmonics and it says, no, the fundamental frequency is this. And it, it adds it in. I suppose I suppose that comes down to a sense of consistency. You know, so if your brain is going to be the referee in this, in this, in this game, that is the listening experience. If it lies to you consistently, we have we have a, a, a basis of of, of of from which we can operate. <laughs> but <laughs> when, you, when your brain sort of says, "No, hang on a second, I don't think that's going to be the case. We just got to insert something here that maybe we have a problem." <laughs> um, so it, it, it it's certainly very interesting in terms of in terms of where does it leave the golden year brigade? One wonders. One wonders. Absolutely. Again, it's you can only deal with what your ears are showing you at the time where you are with what you're listening to. You have to go with what you've got. Yeah. <laughs> the interesting other thing, um, William, is, and, and this is really fascinating, is the fact that our ears are sound generators by themselves. If you mm. go into an anachroic chamber and there's uh, rigorous um, research that has been done where they mic up people's ears and they can record sound that the ears themselves generate. But guess what? You, you don't hear the sounds that your ears generate. Your brain just cuts that out. Alters it out. So here, this begs the question again is, what is the net result if your brain has got the ability to just cut off sounds that it believes may be um, not relevant at the moment or not desirable to listen to at the moment? Um, that can leave you up a creek without a paddle in certain circumstances. But when it gets to critical listening, it's important to understand that if you are focused on something, your brain normally would not cut out what it is that you are focused on. Uh, there's also the thing that's called the cocktail party effect, where it, there's loud music, loud, many, many people talking, but still our brains gave us the ability to focus on your conversation that you're having with me and it just magically gets to get all the rest of whatever it is that's there to disappear you don't hear that you only listen to this conversation sometimes you have to go close to the person because the signal to noise ratio in that uh, exactly exactly it talks so quietly yes but still you you cut out all the loud noises around you or your that your brain considers this is not important to focus on this conversation it just gets rid of and what is amazing is it does it without actually moving your ears into sort of the gathering mode you know <laughs> some animals do have the ability like horses and dogs and cats to move their ears uh we also move our ears just in a different way hmm. <laughs> exactly we have to, to, compete head to be able to do so but yes we certainly can right so we we discussed a little bit about sound uh the fact that it's pressure uh, related it, it it depends on pressure differential to be able to hear anything and that's actually the reason why in a vacuum we can't hear anything because there's no molecules that can transmit the pressure away from one molecule to the next we'll talk about that um, uh, briefly shortly as well 
So how does sound get generated? That's normally by some type of vibration. Uh, if you think of a tuning fork, if you hit a tuning fork and you hold it on the stem, um, it'll actually vibrate at a calibrated or whatever is put on it as, as the frequency, 440 hertz or one kilohertz or whatever. Um, and that is uh, the reason why they use metal for that is because metal is much denser than most other materials. The losses is a lot less in transmitting because of the density, the vibration of the molecule from one molecule to the next and propagate it. And because it is so dense, there is less losses in it. That's why if you hit it, um, it, it rings for quite a while, the, the tuning fork. And, and, and as I've explained, that's, that's the reason why. So pitch is, is what we refer to as the frequency of audible things, is the pitch of the sound. A low pitch is bass or sub-bass frequencies, and a high pitch is mid-range or high mid-range or, 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 or treble, as it's normally referred to. So that is um, what, what, what causes... Uh, sounds as vibrational energy, and the vibration causes the pressure differential by um, by coupling whatever it is that's vibrating to the air. Hence the reason why loudspeakers normally, the bigger the woofer area is, and normally the mid-range is, 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 is not that much affected, yeah. is uh, the fact that the bigger the woofer is, the better the coupling because it's a long wavelengths much bigger than the speaker cone itself in in coupling multiple drivers will do the same thing multiple bass drivers and that is just so that we can create deeper uh pressure differentials uh, as the cone would be vibrating so that's uh as as far as producing the sound is, is uh, considered and and during our last talk uh, william you mentioned um uh, pressure differential between sea level and for us up here at almost 5,000 feet, yeah. uh, 1,400, 1,500 meters. Uh, the speed of sound, interestingly, stays the same across all the various sounds. It, it doesn't vary. Um, it, it does vary over time, but locally, um, the speed of sound won't. Uh, density changes, uh, air pressure changes will change it. Uh, humidity obviously will influence it and temperature will influence the speed of sound, but it's always relative. All sound locally will change at the same magnitude uh, when when that when that change. So interestingly, the speed of sound is about 344 odd meters per second. Um, hence we get the delays um, if somebody is on the opposite side of a rugby field, and we start shouting and jumping up and down. It, it it'll take uh, about a third of a second for the sound to reach to reach them, or half a second. <clears throat> so the the other interesting thing is um, I've I've mentioned uh, infrasound or low frequency uh, that our ears can't pick up. Uh, it's exactly the same, uh, the equivalent for uh, high frequency above twenty kilohertz. As humans, we are just simply not equipped to perceive those in a by our ears uh, as humans we don't have the mechanism to detect frequencies much above uh, 20 kilohertz uh, for me it's probably about at 17 and a half kilohertz that's my limit at, at this point uh, the hearing is not what it used to be uh, dogs can hear interestingly up to about 50 kilohertz 50,000 cycles per second Bats is in the region of 100 to 110 uh, kilohertz, 110,000 hertz, so they can hear very, very high. And um, I'll I'll put up the the picture of uh, the ear and the inner ear, where we can see the outside of the ear. We refer to as the pinna uh, normally. Then we've got the inner ear canal, and then we have the rest of our ear, the tympanic membrane, the staples, the auditory nerves, the cochlea, and, and all of those structures on the inside. And that is really the length of the ear canal, the size of the eardrum itself, and the little windows on the cochlea. That is 
the, the, the weight of the little staples bones that, that uh, does the stimulation of uh, the, the cochlear window. Those are the things that determine what frequencies we can really hear. And without those, well, outside of those things, we can't, our ears can't detect the frequencies. Um, the other bit that is uh, also obviously important is when sounds strike our, our outer ears, um, the lobes of our ears and the inner folds and everything, all of those things are there to direct the sound into the entrance of the ear canal to be able to funnel it into our eardrum so that the um, change transduction, it's called, the change can happen from the pressure waves entering into our eardrums into a signal that our brains can process because our brains can't process directly the, the pressure signals that it receives. Um, and and that's, that's the point that I wanted to raise earlier. Uh, yes. If I can just uh, steal your thunder a little bit. You're here, welcome to. Is that everybody's ear is different. As we have different shaped faces and different shaped bodies, we have different shaped ears. Correct. And those little bones and your cochlea inside your ear are going to differ from person to person. They're never going to be exactly the same. And that has to mean, there's just no other way of, of saying it, is that we hear differently. Yes. So you and I will hear things differently. And our ears are going to process and our brains are going to process things differently. We may have a similar platform once all the processing is done. But the physical interactions that happen between the sound waves getting into our ears have all got to be different because we're not referencing off the same set of ears. I find that absolutely fascinating that my listened experience, I often want to transport myself into someone else's body to see what they what they what 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 they hear, what they think. Uh, I, I never want to do that with a politician because, <laughs> you know, if I wanted to be brain dead, I suppose I could do it on my own terms. But the the, the understanding of how you hear and how you listen, I, I I think would be absolutely mind blowing to understand how other people perceive the auditory world. And I don't think it's going to be necessarily all that different because certainly when you're sitting down with a friend and you're listening to a system critically you both listen and you both hear the same things because you say did you hear that and, and and your friend could say yes i did then there's definitely a basis of comparison across us that 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 that, that is interesting you know it certainly gives us a, a different perception on, on on how things how things are heard quite, and quite correct. i suppose that's just getting back to what we do uh, uh, uh is is that that's the point of review is is kind of like it it gives us a basis of, of, of comparison. And that's it. It's, it's, it's never right. It's never wrong. It's just a basis of comparison. Yes. And that's what I find so interesting about this. So I think then the, the next point um, would be to uh, bring up a picture of the cochlea. Um, the, hmm. the next little picture is just a, uh, a simplified diagram of the cochlea. It's really like a the shell of a snail in a, in a spiral uh, wound uh, a little mechanism. It's 35 millimeters on average in length. And, and as you rightly said, it changes and it varies amongst individuals. We've got no control. That's the genes that, that um, gifted us this or, or, or did not. And uh, that is why there are cochlear implants to assist people um, that have hearing difficulties or, or maybe um, only 10% hearing or whatever the case may be. As long as the nerve is working uh, today with technology, we've got my means to address that. Great. Let's dive into the cochlea. <laughs> yeah, there we go, the cochlea. Um, we need a means inside of our ears, obviously, to translate the pressure into something that is an electrical signal that our brain can actually interpret. And this is where the cochlea is important. Now, uh, let me flash up the other uh, picture because we're going to talk about the little hairs inside the cochlea. Uh, as I said earlier, it's about 35 millimeters in length and a little spiral on the inside of our ear. And 
the bones, the, the ear bones that does the translation from the ear drum into the cochlea stimulates a little window on the cochlea, which then causes pressure waves at all the various frequencies to be translated into the fluid that's inside the cochlea. All the various frequencies can exist all at the same time, and it, it'll propagate throughout that 35 millimeter uh, spiral. And there are actually two different sets. One set of hair is stimulated by the brain, and the other, th it's uh, three rows of, of, of little hairs, and they are of, placed in various places, and the spiral change in its diameter as it, it spirals inwards, and the various places of the cochlea is where the frequencies are interpreted. So there are specific hairs for specific frequency bands, basically. Um, there's about 12,000 hairs in total inside, inside the cochlea. And so it's a very narrow band per frequency on the various hairs. That's why we've got the acute uh, listening or hearing that we've got. And in various places in the, the wide side of the channel, the lower frequencies are interpreted. And in the narrow areas, obviously, it's the high frequencies. And due to the construction of the cochlea and how it spirals and how it narrows, the frequency ranges is, is in the region of 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. And remember I said earlier that we do not have the physical means to interpret um, higher frequencies than 20,000 and lower than 20. And that is the reason why we don't have uh, the mechanism as humans. Now, do we have um, genetically diverse people and people may have is that go up to a little bit above 20 kilohertz or maybe a little bit below um, uh, 20 hertz. Uh, yes, I'm sure there are individuals like that. Um, so when we say we don't have the means to process above and below, it doesn't mean every single individual. It means as a world population in general, we don't. Some people have got bigger ears. Some people have got smaller ears. That's got an influence on even on the level of sounds that we can hear. Some people have got more acute hearing, they can hear lower sounds than what other people can. So this image that's up now will give you the indication, it's a stylized thing again, but it, it shows you more or less where the various frequencies are, are represented. And from this, it's easy to see why decibels and fonds, and I'll talk about fonds shortly, while those two things are logarithmic skulls, like you mentioned in the first episode as well, some of the things for the piano was in a log scale. And the reason why our hearing works in the log fashion is because of this little cochlea. That is what has uh, made us um, uh, such. It's the most efficient way that we can interpret, obviously, the sounds is by having this log uh, means of breaking down um, the sounds that we hear and that we need to listen to. So I think that concludes basically the ear and, and, and what the ear does and how the sounds gets inside of our head. Um, now we'll dive into the listening bit uh, or the listening part of it. So the, the perception is the brain's understanding and interpretation of what reaches our ears. That's the listening part. Um, did so, you hear me, so, honey? Isn't it interesting that we take, for example, the whole process of getting to listening to a, reprodu a reproduction. So if we have a, an orchestral symphony sitting, being recorded, we have the sound waves going into a microphone being converted into electricity, from there going to the recording, again, using electricity, being converted into sound waves and then being converted back into electricity in our brains. So we should, in theory, at some stage in the future, be able to plug our brains straight into that microphone. I think and if we can still embed all of it. Uh, well, we'll actually use Bluetooth and connect it to our mobile devices, <laughs> Elon Musk, and uh, Neuralink has <laughs> anything to do with it. Bypass all of this conversion and just take the digital sounds converted to analog signals and pump it into the brain. Uh, there we go. Long well Wi-Fi, I guess, and audio files. Um, I'm, I'm hoping. Uh, absolutely. 
So, um, <laughs> sorry to say, but, but an inter- no, no, it, <laughs> it's a very interesting. It's a very interesting thing that you've mentioned. And and uh, as I say, Neuralink is one company. There are others, uh, not as well known, but they are working on exactly this type of thing, understanding yeah. the brain signals and being able to inject new signals into the brain. Uh, they actually went to it from or, or attacked the problem from uh, uh, trying to resolve people um, that suffer as paraplegics. Because yes. they will hopefully be able to generate uh, the signals inside the brain and inside the nervous system to be able to help us to stimulate those and 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 help those people and many other medical issues besides. Back to audio, though, <clears throat> I think when when we listen, one of the functions that our brains are have evolved is the integration of sound over a period of time. So research has also proven that our auditory memory is about a quarter of a second long. So reliably, we can identify things if we get the opportunity to re-hear it within a quarter of a second, we can reliably and accurately remember that. Our auditory memory short term is not anything better than that our brain i beg your pardon quarter of a second yes a quarter of a second (laughs) our our brains however has got the ability to also retain uh, the timber of sounds over a long period of time that's how we recognize sounds and we can sometimes even associate sounds and smells you will hear a certain sound and that'll bring back a smell or a taste um, once again, that just proves that the um, various senses do not operate uh, in isolation. Uh, there are certain biases and certain things in our in our uh, sensing systems. What is also Im- important is hearing is stereophonic or binaural. Two ears. Sound sources frequently are. Um, point sources, at least at the distances we listen to them, they are point sources, so they are monorail in in their production, but we listen to them in stereo. How's that for a conundrum? The sound we hear is mono, but we listen in stereo. at the sound in a, a stereo fashion. And that is a very, very important thing when it gets to stereo imaging. Um, and it's, it's interesting how that has actually evolved uh, over very millennia uh, as a protection and a survival mechanism in all mammals, effectively, and most creatures uh, that do have some sensing uh, ability for sounds and light and things like that. We will come back to binaural hearing really in another episode, but there is one complication with our hearing that people normally discard or do not think about. And that is bone conduction. Very, very interesting phenomena. The vibration and the pressure differences enter into our brains via the cochlea, via the skin and the bone of our heads. Now, below 1,500 hertz, more or less, the whole skull vibrates as a single unit. Although our skulls is not a single unit, it's made up of out of various parts. Just think of the picture of a skull that we've seen with all the seams in it. Above 1,500 hertz, those parts vibrate independently of each other, depending on what the frequencies are. But below approximately 1,500 hertz, our whole skull vibrates as a single unit. And that... It's a bunch of people rushing off to their plastic surgeons. <laughs> Go and have some maple pudding. Go and join it all together to, and solidify internal bracing in your skull. <laughs> that will mess with your hearing terribly. Also, just think about how we perceive our own voice if it's recorded and played back to us versus how we sound to ourselves. And why is that? That is bone conduction. Because And there is also an, um, an auditory uh, small um, canal between our throats and our ears. And that also helps with the conduction of sound. So bone conduction bedevils a little bit what people normally discuss when we discuss listening because 
the denser the material, and air is not very dense, the denser the material, the faster the propagation of sound throughout that material because the molecules are closer together and it's easier to transfer the energy from one molecule to the next. And because it's easier, the losses are less. So if we, our brains automatically listen to the bone conducted audio into our ears as well. You can't, if you go to a shooting range where there are the loud uh, plosive sounds when guns are shot um, and you put your fingers in your ears, it doesn't stop half the conduction of the sound. That's why uh, proper over ear protection and sometimes for people that have got sensitive uh, hearing um, something inside the ear canal plus the over covering the bones that are most conductive directly into our inner ear uh, to be able to reduce the the the, the noise that we would uh, that we would hear so that bedevils this whole subject a little bit um, because we discount the bone conductivity to a large extent, but it is an important part of our hearing. And obviously, even if we close our ears, the bone conduction for the sound that enters into our skull, just take an old fashioned analog tick, tick, tick watch and bite on it between your teeth and you will hear a completely different Hello. sound. But lots of people have done this. Uh, sorry, guys, the digital watch doesn't work with us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't make the tick sound. No, it's a, it's a, it's a manual tick tick. <laughs> yes, I, I, I've got a combination. It's digitally driven, but it does have the little motor, so it produces yeah. the tick sound. Uh, but you hear it even sometimes much more clearly than having it against your ear because of the efficiency oh. of induction of the bone into your into your inner ear. Uh, that's just it, an interesting what's interesting, about that, what's interesting about that is you say it's below sort of 1500 hertz. The 1500 hertz, as we learned yesterday, is actually quite high up on the piano register, for instance. So we're talking about a significant listening frequency spectrum of chunk of the of, of our spectrum that we actively listen to. Yes. So it's it's it's, it's it has a, a big role to play. Just just a reminder: below 1500 hertz, the whole skull acts as a single mechanical uh, piece of bone versus above that it, it is various smaller pieces because obviously the smaller pieces got higher resonance frequencies and, and hence the reason that the heavier thicker parts of our skull will not resonate the the base part as an example won't resonate much above uh, apart from harmonics but that'll be vastly suppressed in comparison to what the other parts do and they will transmit it via the the physical density of the rest of the bones into our ears but, but quite correctly so. So I'm going to flash up a, a picture of uh, just the auditory area. And that is, once again, the frequency and log at the bottom. And on the side is the sound pressure level and, and where the, the, the auditory uh, areas are. Now, what is interesting about this is none of this is linear apart from the fact that it's a log graph that just makes it easy to interpret, but none of the response of our ears is linear. Like I said with the cochlea, it's a, mm. it's a log function. So our hearing is a log function and this graph just bears that out. So we can clearly see that on the graph. So I mentioned the word fun earlier, just like in electrical signals, we need a way and the decibel is, and, and that's Bell Telephone Company, uh, the decibel is a tenth of a bell because a bell is a, is a, is a huge number. Um, so for the fun is the, the decibel doesn't take our ears linearity into consideration, but the fun does. So the fun is really, and I'm going to read this off to make sure that I get this right. Uh, the fun is to, uh, the purpose of the fun is to provide a log measurement like decibel for perceived sound magnitude. So how we hear music or speech or any other sounds is to put that on a graph in a way that we can interpret that will make sense to how we perceive the various loudness of various frequencies. Now, uh, our ears is anything but linear. And if we listen to sound at one volume level, the difference between a frequency of one kilohertz and a frequency of 20 hertz may be yay much, 
but when we listen it to it at a volume level that's 10 times higher, in other words, 10 dBs higher, or, or, or not 10 dBs higher, 3 dBs higher, I beg your pardon, let me not get my volume and dBs messed up here, um, the difference becomes less between how much volume we need for the low frequency versus the 1 kilohertz. And that's what this one uh, describes. Just to give you an idea, 30 fonts, which is a general... Uh, low listening level, low level of volume, there is a difference of 58 dB. We need a base note at 20 kilohertz to be 58 dB higher than one at one kilohertz to perceive them at the same volume level. Otherwise, they are perceived at the one kilohertz is much louder than the, the 20 hertz signal. Uh, as we go up to uh, other, I mean, the graph shows it, but at different levels, that relationship changes. And that just shows that our hearing, once again, it varies between individuals. No two individuals is 100% correct. This is the average amongst uh, the population where the research were done. I must, I must say, I find that, uh, and it's been the case throughout my listening career, is that I always get the best listening done at higher volume levels than other comparative people in my position. So a friend of mine will, will listen to his music at, at a reference level, at a lower level than me, not necessarily much lower, but certainly lower. Whereas I get more when I'm listening to things that are at a, at a higher, at a higher volume. Yes. So uh, it's just, that's my, my sort of reference point or my sort of audible experiences. It, it's a preference at the end of the day. Preference. to get the most en enjoyment out of it and what is interesting for that is that i think starts explaining why there is preference between various reviewers and various people on forums and everywhere why sometimes there's a huge firestorm and and the reason for the firestorm i think is the not the lack of understanding i, I think that'll be disingenuous to say it's a lack of understanding but just forgetting about these individual differences, uh, which creates these perception um, uh, issues for various people, where it's more enjoyable for you if the level is lower and for me if the level is higher. Uh, it's it's quite normal. It's quite normal. Great. So I think that concluded most of the technical bits about hearing and, and, and how we hear and the various things that has an influence on that. Let me talk a little bit about music as a language. And I think ha, people don't universal think of, language. <laughs> people we don't go. necessarily think of music as a language. But the funny thing is music is probably the one and only universal language apart well, apart from art. So there are two universal languages. Art is a bit more difficult to interpret because Culture has got something to do with art a little bit more than the interpretation of culture and music. I was stunned uh, uh, quite a long time ago when I discovered a thing called a musical dictionary. And the first one that I laid eyes on was about, I think, 60 millimeters in thickness. And, and I was absolutely flabbergasted that there can be such a thing. I have since discovered that there are very, very many dictionaries on music. And some of the oldest ones that I've discovered, and I'll bring up a picture on that, is from the 1740s, when a music di dictionary was, was published. Uh, I think the language of music is, is much older than that, obviously, as old probably as humans. Um, but musical dictionaries, that is a thing. Um, I was I was quite surprised. Muses will obviously now start laughing at me, but but you know, <laughs> uh, at, some, at some point before they were muses, they also didn't know that musical dictionaries existed. Um, so much for that. Uh, what is interesting about music is the fact that it's a universal language. You don't need any written language on a sheet music page for a musician in another country not being able to speak your language or English or whatever their native, native language may be, and they can read and interpret the music and, and you can enjoy the music, or if you're a muso and you're both musos, you can jam together just on a piece of sheet music. No sheet 
Latin music, let me just pronounce that properly, uh, no matter where they are from. So that is the universal language in the world. Um, you don't need to listen to music and to enjoy music. We don't need to understand music at that level necessarily. But it's not a bad thing. Myself as an example, I'm not a muso. I can't really read sheet music. I do have some grasp of what happens on there. My my daughter is, 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 uh, gets music lessons, so obviously that rubs off a little bit on on, on me as well. Um, but in in my journey as an audiophile, it has always been an interesting concept as to understand a little bit about what I listen to. I get bored as an individual, me personally, quickly if I have to listen to a foreign language being spoken that I'm not capable of understanding. I get bored quite easily um, if I'm overseas uh, traveling and, and I'm in Spain or in Italy, the local television or radio stations, I, I can't listen to it or, or watch it because I don't understand anything. So with music, we don't necessarily have to understand everything about the music, but I do believe, and in my personal experience, it holds true for me, if I understand a little bit about um, the various things like how music is structured, the octaves, the fact that that is logarithmic, um, the fact about harmonics or overtones and what that does, I do have a bass guitar and sometimes I attempt to learn bass guitar. I'm not very good at it. I'm actually very bad at it. Um, but But that helps me enjoy music more. Uh, not necessarily playing an instrument, but just understanding music and being able to have an appreciation of what happens in the back end and understanding sound propagation and how we hear and the foibles of our own hearing um, and the differences between me and other people, me and you, me and anybody watching this podcast. Um, I think that that goes a long way for me to help enjoy music more, which is, I guess, what this series is really about, is to understand a little bit more to enable us to enjoy it a bit more. And it doesn't have to happen on day one. It can happen progressively over time. I concur 110% there. You know, for me, the enjoyment of music is watching people do what I cannot. Um, you know, when you're watching a, a concert grand pianist, um, and I had the, and it is a privilege, of watching Faisal say a couple of years ago, back before COVID, um, the way that he plays the piano, the way he interprets the music, the way he, he he engages with this, is something on a different level that I will never be able to do. There are very few people in the world that will be able to do it and to and to and to and to watch a master at his craft live is just something phenomenal, and 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 that speaks to as you say, the universal language, as, as, as the case may be. I just want to grab my phone quickly. You, you, you say that, <laughs> no problem. You were saying that uh, uh, you get very bored of, 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 of foreign language when you're, when you're watching TV overseas. I, I, I'm in complete agreement with you, um, with one exception. Uh, if you're in Japan and you're watching those Japanese game shows, they are outrageously, outrageously hilarious because no one has a clue of what's going on there. So you're all in the same boat. But uh, outside of Japan, uh, I tend to switch to music channels, um, and 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 that's what I listen to if I'm if I'm not listening or streaming on, on exactly my or my exactly the same for me. If I'm overseas and and I, I I need some entertainment, it is music that I listen to because no matter what the language is. I listen to the music. I enjoy the music. And and there are lots and lots of them that is enjoyable. And it's so interesting that if you seek out local music in a different in a different part of the world, how you can pick up similarities to everything that you've already heard anywhere before. As you say, it just you you get a, a measure of comfort from it. And that may be because as you say, we are all speaking the same universal language. It gives you a familiarity. So the, the 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 parting thing for me, I guess, is between understanding our ears, how we hear, hello, honey, and how we listen. Uh, yes, I will do so right away, honey. Um, it's the honey do list. It's just a question of how quickly you get through it, uh, but it never ends. In understanding 
all of this, I think, gives us the ability to enjoy the gear and the the money we spend on it, and 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 give 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 back to ourselves some satisfaction and some enjoyment, uh, or lots and lots of enjoyment um, from having just a little bit of a better understanding. I mean, we don't have to go and study. Uh, physiology and, and all of these other things to be able to do so. Um, but I, I I believe in general um, nowadays with, with all the resources to, at our disposal, the internet and YouTube and um, Spotify and all the streaming services and these things, um, it, it, it gives us the option to understand a little bit about our own choices that we want to make and why we make them. And why there are differences? Why do we have thousands and thousands of different speakers? Now we can start appreciating the reason behind uh, a lot of things. Exactly. exactly. Couldn't have said it better. So, thank you. What a what an interesting session. Loved it. Thank you very much, uh, guys. Oh, if you remember again, well, the yeah. little subscribe <laughs> uh, to the channel. I I have uploaded the first episode and. And I must say there's been quite a few views and they, there was a professional recording engineer, recording artist, and he gave us a big thumbs up. So uh, thanks to him. Uh, Wonderful. I, um, and I think we're laying, we're, laying, we're laying a solid foundation for all the future podcasts to come because, you know, there's, there's uh, looking at our list, it's, <laughs> it's lengthy. <laughs> It's We've a got a lot of ground to cover. We've got and, a lot of ground to cover. And we haven't covered any gear in that list at all. Nothing. There's there's no 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 equipment reviews, no uh, nothing wrong with equipment reviews. We'll probably get there at some point. Uh Absolutely. we might get questions about things like that, which I think it'll it'll lead to that. As you said, this hopefully will leave us with a solid foundation. Now the next episode uh after this one is probably makes sense to um, talk about um, not just critical thinking and critical listening, but about sound staging. What do you think about that as the next uh, the next topic? It's a logical, logical step. I, I, I certainly think so. So forward to it. In, I guess episode three will be on sound staging and imaging. Um, uh, you said in the first episode, no controversial subjects. Hopefully, it won't be controversial, but we will unpack because now we understand a bit about our ears and listening and hearing, and that is absolutely vital uh, when it gets to sound staging. I will I will share an experience I had on sound staging in that episode uh, when it comes up that baked my noodle. There are not many things that bake my noodle these days because I'm just an aged, jaded, cynical <laughs> hack of a journalist. But this one did, and uh, it, 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 it really was very interesting. And uh, I urge and encourage anybody who gets an opportunity to do what I did to do so because it was, I, don't say, I, I won't say transformatory. It was just very, very interesting, completely against anything I'd, I'd had any sort of prejudiced notions of, of, of hearing, but we'll, we'll touch more on that in the next, in the next episode. Certainly we will. Well, thank you for your time. And thank you, Zara. Uh, till next time. Thank you for the education. It's been amazing. Thank you very much. Thanks, William. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao.